But I think as we've heard today, food has the opportunity to be more than something we just sell. It's something that can really define Canada's place in the world. I was wondering if you could speak to what actions or shifts you think are required to move food from being a trade priority to being a broader geopolitical priority for the country, and what you think that might look like, and what you think the consequences for Canada's food sector would be if we were able to do that. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be part of this event, and th thank you for letting me join virtually from, from London. Uh, the question is, uh, is very broad in its dimensions. Basically, what moves food from Canada's regular trade agenda to our strategic geopolitical agenda? Uh, there are many parts to that answer, and I'll just try to touch on some of them. Uh, first of all, I think this has been covered in, in uh, a lot of the commentary earlier today. Uh, to, to have leverage and relevance in the world, Canada needs to have what the world wants. Uh, we must be very good at producing big volumes of top quality food products that are absolutely reliable in terms of food safety and timely delivery. We assume that is one of our great strengths, but we should never take our productive capacity for granted, nor our uh, logistical capacity. Secondly, uh, we need to be ahead of everyone else in the world, virtually, on research, innovation, and sustainability. Uh, to know what the world wants and what is going to require, not just now, but next, and then after that, and after that, and why. And in that regard, let me just cite a good example. That is the, uh, the PIC Innovation Supercluster, Protein Industries Canada. Uh, I think that's a very strong example of doing innovation very well. I would also argue that we uh, need several big water infrastructure projects to better manage and cope with the consequences of climate change. And we need long-term solutions in Canada to the supply issues affecting fertilizers to buttress Canada's production capabilities. We also need strong, unmistakable, and continuous Canadian branding of our agri-food products. Not corporate branding, not provincial branding, but unequivocal Canada branding, coupled with helpful and timely before-market and after-market services to demonstrate a smart, caring, and committed supplier. Fifthly, we should include more actual farmers on our trade missions and diplomatic missions. Understanding the food needs and opportunities in other countries and mobilizing political support at home is most effectively done by grassroots people who vote. I would also pick up on one of Ted Billier's points about China. I think we need to be patient, clear-eyed, and long-term in our approach to that diplomacy, making the point that China's current approach to its own food security is fundamentally unworkable and self-defeating. It is in their self-interest to support, not undermine, an effective rules-based multinational trading system. And we need to explain that point patiently over and over and over again. As for Russia, we need to aggressively combat their totally dishonest, but nonetheless effective disinformation campaign that is convincing many countries in Africa and in the global south that world hunger, malnutrition, and food insecurity are in fact being caused by Western sanctions against Russia. That is a total crock of unmitigated horse feathers, as I used to say from time to time in the House of Commons. Since making its pledge in 2015 to eliminate food insecurity by 2030, the world has been sliding for multiple reasons in exactly the wrong direction. And the most serious exacerbation of that crisis in the past year has been Russia's brutal and totally illegal war 
of imperial aggression against Ukraine. Putin is the biggest threat to humankind in the world today. Putin is the biggest cause of global food insecurity. And we have a huge task ahead to counteract his diplomats and his bots and his trolls on social media who lie relentlessly on his behalf. Finally, when crises occur, like the war in Ukraine, Canada needs to be quick and nimble and proactive to put itself in a leadership position among international organizations on food-related issues. Don't hold back. Don't pause or wait. We are a member of the FAO and of the World Food Program and of the International Grains Council and the International Maritime Organization, as well as the IMF and the World Bank and the G7 and NATO and much more. We need to be louder and far more visible, but always strategic and focused, knowing what our arguments are and where we want to get to in the end. But I think Canada has a big role to play. Thanks Thank very you. much, Tyler. Thank you. So I'm going to come back to some of those points uh, in a minute, but, but I'd like to ask a quick question about your time in London. You were in London for 12 months almost before the Russian invasion. It's been almost 12 months now yeah. since Russia invaded. How has the role that food plays in the work that you do every day changed from your first year in office to your second year? It's changed quite a bit. In, in the first year, we were doing all the things that, that foreign missions typically do to promote Canadians and Canadian businesses and Canadian opportunities abroad. Uh, there were trade missions, there were uh, visiting delegations from the private sector, from farm organizations, from, uh, from provincial governments. We were promoting trade shows. Uh, we were uh, helping to, to finalize sales and investments. My, my first couple of weeks here, we, uh, we finished one of the investments uh, in the, um, in the uh, uh, protein uh, supercluster, uh, that particular one in, uh, in Alberta. Uh, so it, it, was, it was sort of business as usual in that first year. In the second year, there has been a far greater focus on, on food security um, and a greater sense of, uh, of, of urgency. Uh, I said we're a member of the International Maritime Organization and a member of the International Grain Council. Uh, Canada was pivotal in both those organizations immediately after the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine uh, to make sure that the IMO and the IGC, uh, uh, in effect, re-endorsed the position of the United Nations in condemning uh, the Russian invasion uh, and pointing out what it would mean for issues like food security in the world. Um, uh, in addition to those, uh, those motions, uh, those two organizations, the IMO and the IJC, IGC, uh, have held a whole series of webinars through this past summer and fall, uh, getting the very best experts in the world together, going through all the statistics, reporting on the impact of the war on Ukraine's productive capacity. Uh, and you could, they did it electronically. It was fascinating to watch, as you could see the areas being affected by conflict and how they they, uh, they were lost to production for a certain uh, period of time, uh, making sure that all of that data was being collected and disseminated around the world. Of course, working on the Black Sea Grain Initiative to get uh, at least three of the Ukrainian ports functional again. Uh, and as a result of the, uh, the Black Sea Initiative, and great credit there to uh, uh, the United Nations and to Turkey, uh, two, uh, two major players in that initiative. Uh, about 17 and a half uh, million tons uh, has been moved in the course of the last six or seven months. Interestingly enough, another 23 million tons has been moved uh, overland, uh, either by truck or by rail, uh, or, and also uh, by barge down the Danube. Uh, so, so supporting that that global effort to, uh, uh, to try to get around the uh, incapacity in, in the Ukrainian food system that was imposed on Ukraine uh, by, uh, by, by Russia. But yes, it, it has made a, a, a big difference. 
uh, and food insecurity and the global politics of food is part of almost every conversation that goes on amongst the diplomatic community here in London. Great. So I'd like to go to Steve now. Steve, um, I think it was mentioned earlier, you're known as one of our foremost trade negotiators. You cut your teeth, really tried to build and modernize a trading system that benefited Canada for a great many years, but a trading system that doesn't work as well as it used to. One of the reasons why it doesn't work as well today is because the system was really made to make it easier for food to get into a country. But one of the problems we have from food security is actually getting food out of countries and getting food from those that are stockpiling it to those that need it to feed their populations. Um, do you think that the existing system uh, maybe can deal with anything, but can deal with this current, current situation that we face today? And what do you think could or should change? Okay, thanks, uh, Tyler. Um, and first of all, thank you for the invitation to join you today. Um, I've been watching a lot of this virtually and it's a very interesting conference. Um, but I'd lead off by saying, uh, no, I don't think the current rules-based system can address food security. I don't think it can address many pressures in the system at this point in time. As you mentioned, uh, the rules were developed in a much different period. There was an abundance of food. So we looked at things like export subsidies and domestic subsidies that were encouraging even further production. We were pushing for trade liberalization, which um, was something that there was a, a lot of buy-in uh, in, among countries to push um, and tried to advance that. And we tried to advance new rules that would make the whole system fair, whether you're a large country or a small country. Um, that last one in particular is still important. The others are not as important. And we're now being driven by a number of other different kinds of themes. The pendulum has swung from uh, trade liberalization or free trade to protectionism, particularly in some countries. Um, we have moved away from trying to keep politics out of trade to starting to recognize that geopolitics are playing a major role in trade at this point in time, this era. Um, and we're, to some extent, moving away from relying on market forces in the economy to an increasingly interventionist kind of approach, some for valid reasons. Um, so we're seeing that um, uh, more talk about industrial strategy. We're seeing talk about uh, different ways of managing the world economy, friend shoring, near shoring, those kinds of things. So all of that is, is changing all of the dynamics. And I think if we're talking about the rules-based system, well, the rules aren't being enforced anymore. Uh, the WTO is not capable of resolving disputes because the U.S. won't complete the appointment of, a, of members to the appellate body of, of the WTO. So that is entirely dysfunctional. Uh, I would be very pleasantly surprised if the U.S. Uh, accepted any dispute settlement panel outcome against it in the foreseeable future. Um, I, I'm not sure that they're sufficiently bought into the system to take actions that they feel might compromise their own interests. Um, so I think um, what is driving trade policy now is more strategic types of approaches and those are keen on a few different themes we do have the protectionist issue that is driving a lot of this but uh, we've seen the geopolitics come in in a certain way and much of that is focused on china the u.s is very preoccupied with addressing issues related to china particularly overproduction uh, subsidization those kinds of issues um, and the third issue is really climate change. How do we address climate change in all of this? Now, the U.S. and some other countries around the world have figured out that if you take a very firm and clear approach to addressing climate change, you can also address your China problem um, or related <laughs> problems like China. Uh, because there's increasing talk about tying market access to environmental performance. If you're a good environmental performer, you get the access. If you're not, maybe you're going to have to pay a higher price. Maybe you're going to have to pay tariffs. Um, there could be penalties there. So this is 
being talked about in fairly small, small quarters among small uh, countries so far, a small group of countries. But I think it's going to increasingly drive um, where we go from here. So those efforts are underway. And I think from a food perspective, uh, food has always been more complicated. Uh, you know, typical customers cut across up to 100 countries or more um, for some commodities. Um, you don't get that in other sectors of the economy in the same way. Food has a sensitivity to it um, because it's fundamental to survival that other commodities don't have to it. Uh, from an agriculture and food perspective, we need the China market, as someone mentioned earlier today. Um, we're not trying to get China out of the picture. We need them in the picture, at least as a buyer. Um, so all of those things make it much more difficult. And, and just briefly on what could or should change, I think, first of all, we need to recognize that the existing system is not working and it's not likely to come back um, at least anytime soon. Uh, I don't see any sign of the US looking to go back to the uh, era when they were leading the charge on trade liberalization, and opening markets. Um, they're not there and every successful negotiation multilateral, multilaterally has involved the US pushing hard uh, as the main country that would uh, ensure that a result took place. Um, so in order to do that, we need to think about, first of all, to improve the situation, we need to rebuild the rules. We need to rebuild them, not simply by looking at trade liberalization and the market forces and market access and, and subsidies and all of that kind of thing, but how do we manage the introduction of further rules that will be economic in nature um, in areas like environment. We will be imposing uh, economic conditions because of environmental performance. How do we fit all that together? Same in food security. How do we provide the right kind of incentives or disincentives uh, to ensure that countries are actually doing that? They won't be market forces that are going to do that. It has to be introduced. So how do we take what we've negotiated as trade agreements as, as a bit of a base, but recognize that we're going to be deliberately introducing distortions to that. Um, and I think that's not necessarily an impossible task. I don't even think it's the most difficult task, um, but it's something that we need to, uh, need to spend a lot of time on. So Chantel, Steve talked about distortions and distortions coming into the system. Um, some of those distortions will be challenges for Canada and some of those distortions will be opportunities for Canada. We've talked a lot about food security today. Sustainability has come up. Um, I think a lot of it is, comes down to, for people in Canada, what are those opportunities to uh, use those distortions to add value? What are the opportunities for, to drive growth? I was wondering if you could, could kind of pick up that point and talk about, where, again, where you see the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead and, and how do we leverage those distortions to our advantage? Sure. So the beauty of being the chair of CAP, and he has me in this seat, he can change every question he had planned for me. So that's, that'll be the, the theme of the, the next hour here. But I think, so, so listening today, number one, it's been excellent to be back in Ottawa at an event like this. And it's nice to have seen and heard progress on some of the some of the things that I was working on a decade ago here, and then it's also been interesting to hear how some things still need to work. Um, but then I think the nuance here is really this theme of environment, climate, and food security, and. The reality, I think, where we're at from an agri-food sector in Canada is we're at an absolute inflection point. And one of the things that I've absolutely always appreciated as a Canadian in global roles or in North American roles is that my most memorable times in this industry have been when we've come together, whether that be to negotiate a, a, a trade deal, whether that be to build industries. 20 years ago, we didn't have the canola industry we had or the protein processing industry. And lo and behold, now look at the work that, that's getting done, done through PIC. And we're a strong exporter and we're diversifying and some of these challenges or inflection points that we have coming at us. For example, 
from an environment and climate perspective. Well, what does that mean? That means decarbonization of, of, of the supply chains that we have, and particularly in North America. That creates opportunities for us. That creates opportunities for us to diversify. So a, a lot of a, additional North American demand. It creates opportunities, I think, for us to start to think about what, one of the, the unique things that I, I look at on a daily basis is how vegetable oils and, and fuels are, are coming into play. Where's the opportunity there? Where's the opportunity for us to come together and learn and create it so that, and I don't know was, whether it was Chris, whoever asked the question earlier today, you know, how do we make sure that it doesn't become a liability and that we can still stay competitive? That's the challenge that we have. That's a challenge that we have within the country, a country that can easily come together and start thinking about how we operate in a broader ecosystem to solve for that. But then as we do that, that's going to mean we're all going to be comfortably uncomfortable because it's, it's not something that, that, that we're necessarily comfortable with. And then as it relates to trade and holding others accountable to some of those opportunities that we've been able to leverage, and I think in particular from an environment and climate perspective, because we are innovators. If there's anything that we've proven in this country is that we will innovate and we will come together. And I think that's the opportunity that we have. And I think it is a critical time. Um, I think probably in, I, I look at it, I've been with Cargill for, for 20 years now. This is, I look at a time to be able to influence, right? And lean in on something. I think as a country, this is something where we have an opportunity to lean in, lead from a, a, a national perspective, but global perspective. But it all means we're all going to be on the edge of our seats trying to find that solution. Sorry, Tyler. So part of the way that we lean in involves changing how we think about things. I mean, you're with Cargill, but you and your, your family farm together in Saskatchewan. Um, one of the things I think a lot of farmers, when we talk about uh, exports, we talk about economic benefits. I think that that's the way that the sector has talked about uh, trade for a long time. But as it's, we've clearly heard today, trade is a food security uh, uh, essential. It, it is needed. It, is, it serves a different role today than it may have. We, talk, we heard earlier about, again, the benefits of Canadian food that has a low carbon footprint. You know, the more food we can sell, the better we are from a food security perspective. How do you think we go about changing the way people think about it, moving from just a, a purely economic play selling more Canadian food around the world to thinking about it from more of a, a food security or, or a sustainability perspective. The High Commissioner talked about the need to engage farmers in it. I think, again, we, it it's, can be a little bit outside of people's comfort zones, but I was wondering if you could speak to how that, that plays out. Yeah, so I think a couple things. Um, as I look at it, it's what are we trying to, to solve for here? Are we trying to solve for sustainability and environment for the sake of that? No, we're trying to solve for reducing global warming. If we reduce global warming, inevitably, we should reduce the volatility in food production, which should then directly have an impact around food flows, period, right? I think the second thing is, and that's what I speak to, we need to focus, and I, and I this is a, a call, if we think from a, a policy and a government perspective, this would be like a personal call of a, a passionate Saskatchewan farmer that's very vested in this agri-food sector is we need to focus on the outcomes that we're trying to solve for. I agree, we've all made targets around greenhouse gas reductions, right? By 2030 and 2050, we've all done that. But let's not be prescriptive. Let's come together to make sure that we can find as many tools to put into that tool box to deliver to that outcome so that it can be to, to our advantage um, as, as we think about not just uh, four, four years from now, as programming tends to go, we need to think about 2030, 2050. A long-term view is absolutely imperative. And so one of the themes of today that I wanted to, to pick up with the panel is around the need for strategy. That, that was talked about uh, in the first session of the day. It's, it's come up several times. But I wonder if, if the seven or eight points that the High Commissioner raised at the beginning of his remarks actually is a bit of that framework for what a strategy could look like for agriculture. I'm not sure if that's what the High Commissioner was intending to do, but I wonder if that's a starting point for where we go from here. And, and so um, 
the three of you approach this from, from different perspectives, a political perspective, a government perspective, an industry perspective, but if we think about actually delivering on a strategy and, and calling for a more ambitious strategy is not new, uh, it's been talked about for a long time, but delivering on a strategy, actually coming up with that strategy seems to be the hard part. Um, maybe start with you, uh, High Commissioner, has enough changed for us actually to end up with the motivation to develop a strategy and then act on it? Well, I hope it has. Uh, only time will, will tell. Uh, but as, uh, as Steve pointed out, uh, uh, compared to when uh, uh, he and I were first together in the Department of Agriculture, uh, what was it, 20 some more than that years ago, uh, <laughs> a, a, a lot has changed. Um, and I, uh, some, some not so good change and some is change for the better. Uh, but I think you can see some of the pieces coming together. Uh, pick, I think, the, the protein uh, industry's uh, uh, approach to, uh, to innovation, the super cluster. It's clearly working. It's the best super cluster in the country. Uh, and uh, I hope we see more and more investment in and through PIC to expand that push on innovation, on research, on science, to make sure that we're the best in, in the world. Um, uh, I, I think the, uh, uh, the notion of the new uh, agri-food office that will be located uh, uh, in the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, is, a, is a good idea that might well be replicated elsewhere to bring before market and after market services closer to the customers in a more continual basis rather than off and on, in and out uh, as, uh, as, as trade missions uh, flow. Um, uh, I, I think the, uh, the long-term approach that Ted Billier has talked about uh, in terms of uh, a diplomatic uh, effort toward China, clear-eyed, recognizing who we're dealing with, uh, and this is a, this is a major power in the world that has a tendency to resort to, to uh, hostage diplomacy. Uh, we, need to, we need to constantly reinforce his point that the way they manage their food system is likely to fail their people. Uh, and they, they need a relationship with uh, countries like ours and others uh, that can, uh, that can uh, help them solve their problem while at the same time uh, facilitating uh, good, decent, profitable uh, international trade. Um, investments in, uh, in, in our productive capacity, like uh, uh, the big water projects that are being discussed in, in places like Alberta and Saskatchewan, really major ones that would give us the capacity to, to uh, better control uh, the unpredictable water flows that we're going to have to deal with uh, as a consequence of climate change. The interesting thing about that climate science is they say the, the flow of water off the eastern slope of the Rockies onto the prairies is likely to be more, not less, as a result of climate change. It'll just be more unpredictable too. Deluges followed by droughts. And we need the infrastructure to be able to, to uh, even that out and move it around and uh, make it a benefit, not, uh, uh, not a, uh, a threat. Um, being nimble in responding to international crises, I think, is also critically important for us uh, in responding to the situation in, in Ukraine, for example. Uh, Canada has uh, made a major increase in its commitment to the, to the World Food Program. Uh, we've invested through Western Canadian entrepreneurs uh, in expanding Ukraine's internal storage capacity. So when they, when they can't get the grain out because of, of the Russian invasion, then at least they've got the very best storage equipment to make sure that the crop isn't lost uh, because of, uh, of spoilage uh, in the off season and, and, and so forth, practical things like that. You know, it, it, I think you can see the, the, the elements, big and small, of a strategy coming together. Uh, and I think, Tyler, there is maybe a greater will among all the participants, I think we've heard some of that today, uh, to, uh, to pull it together and, uh, and uh, put Canada in a position to be a major food player in the world that the world cannot do without. 
And so, so all day long, we've heard a lot of talk about Canada in, in the world, but um, when we're not at a conference under the heading of Canada in a hungry world, sometimes I think we could, it's easy to forget about that. But clearly any strategy, any ambitious strategy is going to involve producing more Canadian food that is going to need to find a home in markets outside of this country. Um, Steve, we, we talked again about the work that you did at the, uh, over your career, setting those rules, building those, those systems. Um, there was reference earlier to uh, the Ottawa group and some leadership we're trying to show today, but uh, it seems like it can be a challenge getting the, the broader government to, to think about how do we build those systems, those new systems, so that Again, one, we can produce more food in this country, and then we've got the right systems in place to get it out of, of the country. What, what do you think is needed or, or, or what needs to change in order to have people better think more strategically about the opportunities that exist for Canadian food outside of our borders? Well, I, I think that's probably the hardest part of the question. Um, Ralph, uh, the High Commissioner gave a number of... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Oh, good examples of, of things that are going on right now, and those are all you know, projects or, or approaches we should be taking. But what I keep thinking about is how do we turn this into a strategy? Because I think a lot of this content is not that complicated. I think even the notion of developing a modified rules-based system that in, incorporates environment and food insecurity mm -hmm. and other elements in it, Preparing, sitting down at a table and preparing that isn't that hard for those that have experience in it. Um, the hard part is getting the buy-in. Um, and we have big challenges in the U.S. now in getting buy-in on any kind of innovative ideas that involve other countries. Um, we have difficulties with China, with other big players in the world. Um, so how do we do this? How do we get the buy-in? How do we build that? And I think it has to start with these ideas around innovation and, and, and the creativity that I think we are uniquely suited to bring to the table. So building a set of core ideas on various issues and then start the engagement process. First of all, with allies that we think we can work with. Um, Ted Bellier's uh, discussion about the, the net food exporting countries uh, might not be a bad place to start because it would have to start fairly small and start to build. Uh, when I spent the time I spent at the, at the WTO, I was always surprised at how eager other countries were to have Canada come in the room and show leadership, uh, put down an idea that they could start to think about. It doesn't have to be the complete picture, the final solution. It's a matter of putting ideas out, starting to build that dialogue so others contribute ideas, and only then can you start to, to build up support and buy-in. Now, you don't even necessarily need the US or the China or Europe in that room. Build it up with smaller countries. Start to get some momentum behind it. If you get enough of them, others are going to have to pay, no, pay, it to pay attention. But I think, so I'm going to ask you this question and I'll come back to the High Commissioner as well, but Chantel, do you think we have the buy-in in Canada today, let, let alone the buy-in in, in uh, Beijing or Washington or Brussels or any of the smaller countries you talked about? Do we have the buy-in <laughs> Do we have the buy -in, in, in Ottawa and, and across the country to do what Steve talked about? Yeah, so thanks, Tyler. A um, <laughs> couple things. Um, I think back to um, probably... 12 years ago, a decade ago, it was a decade ago, we started doing some of the public trust work in, in Canada, right? Do we have the buy-in then across the sector? Absolutely not. I think is that table stakes now and all that work? I think we've come a heck of a long way. Why am I talking about public trust? Because trust is absolutely foundational. So to your point, do we have the buy-in? Yeah, everybody in this room wants to sort through it, right? Everybody in this room has the exact same Canada brand. Let's go. We know what, what, what we can do. I think that we need to trust that all of the other stakeholders, uh, recognizing there are also new stakeholders. 
right? I think back a decade ago, we were thinking about, I was saying this to, to Roy earlier today, it's like we were thinking about what was going on from a trade perspective, what was going on at CFIA, and what was going on at A Canada. That was it. I mean, some other nuances there, right? Health Canada was in that discussion either. Environment was nowhere near at the front of the agenda that it is right now. And other interests and the impact that that has across, so I think there are new stakeholders. I think that some, some trust across the chain, and a lot of this I'm looking at from my farm and bigger, right, from afar a little bit, um, I think some of that's been eroded. I think we need to rebuild that trust. But if you ask me, is the willingness there? Absolutely. We need to figure out how we rise to the occasion and bring ourselves together at this point in time to rally around that. Steve, is the buy-in, does it exist in Canada to do, to show that leadership that you think that we should, could? Um, not yet. Uh, I don't, at least I don't see it as of yet, but I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg discussion to some extent. I don't think you're going to get a lot of buy-in until people understand what the vision is, what the strategy is, and then if they can see themselves in it, you can start to build from there. Um, so I think the first step needs to be starting to sketch out where do we want to go in concrete terms? How can we maximize our leverage internationally? How can we most efficiently and effectively produce our food and address food security issues? Um, some ideas, doesn't need to be comprehensive, but some ideas start drawing people in, expand the ideas, but you really got to get that first. Um, sure, everybody at, at a high level is going to agree, we need a strategy, um, but then you have to start thinking about what strategy is and you may lose some people along the way if it's not done properly in a way that, you know, you can have it make sense in terms of a longer term vision. So, Mr. Goodale, if you put your political hat back on, if the... <laughs> I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> well, maybe deal with a hypothesis. If, if, if the sector came, if the sector came and said, here's our vision, here's what we think that broad outline of a strategy looks like, is there a willingness at the senior levels of government to act on it, or is that going to be as heavy of a lift as coming up with that broad outline is? Well, I, I wouldn't want to um, uh, underestimate the, uh, the the magnitude of the of the challenge here, uh, but I but I think yes. Um, I, I, I think if if and you don't need to have it all it all baked and done before you start moving. I think as uh, uh, as both of the other panelists have mentioned, there are there are some very interesting elements uh, of the strategy uh, on on research and science and innovation, for example, and, and, and many others, where you're likely to get consensus and support and momentum more easily than perhaps in some of the more contentious areas. So start with the easier stuff, um, make progress and then move on, make progress and move on. Uh, that's, that's how a lot of the trade negotiations work and uh, start with some of the more, uh, uh, more easy areas to, to begin with. But I think as the momentum builds, uh, people recognizing the strategic nature of, of food in the world and Canada's enormous uh, productive uh, potential, uh, the credibility that we have uh, in a lot of world circles. That's, that's one thing that I found very interesting in this posting in, uh, in London, when you go into that, that council of the International Maritime Organization or into the International Grains Council, we're not necessarily the biggest country in the room uh, but there is a a real credibility that's uh, that's associated with Canada's track record uh, and uh, it, it sounds a little bit trite to say it that we punch above our weight but I think we do and we should use that credibility that's been accumulated over many years uh, to uh, to try to uh, uh, move Canada's position forward and I think the world uh, would welcome it. Steve? Well, I, I agree with everything that, that Ralph said, but I think what I keep coming back to is that the only way that we can move something forward um, that's really going to matter is if it becomes a national priority. Like I've gone and had meetings with, uh, with the Germans and 
they tell you right up front, the auto sector is our key priority. We, we work between government and, uh, and the private sector, and we develop strategies for how we can advance Germany's interest through the auto sector. The sector. Other countries do the same thing in many places. We've never done that in Canada in a, in a direct way where we're going to try to have government and industry work together to promote a sector or sectors as meeting national objectives or, or areas where we would pursue national objectives. Um, and I think that tends to focus the mind, it tends to focus resources, and it tends to push things forward. So um, there would probably be discomfort about picking some sectors, but not other sectors. But I think the food sector can kind of stand alone in some ways in that kind of, uh, of discussion. So I think it's a matter of giving it enough profile, and then the resources and the efforts and the creativity will come. So we'll take some questions from the audience. So if you have questions, please come up to the mic. But, but Chantal, I want to pick up on, on that point that Steve just made around um, the sector as a national priority. I mean, Dominic Barton was here earlier today. He called on it all of those years ago. This is, this is not new within the agriculture community. We talk to ourselves all of the time about how the country should use us as a national strategic priority. What do you think is needed to change, Chantel, for that to actually happen and for people outside of agriculture to realize that that should be the case? Yeah, I think a little bit of it's happening right now. The discussion around food security and security, we're looking at inflation, the reality of, of the importance of food. Um, the ambassador from France thought, you know, we, we, we maybe didn't have the same sense of urgency. But guess what? We're starting to get a little bit of a sense of urgency. I, I pay a lot of attention to what my food costs now. I waste a lot less food. I, I'm being exceptionally transparent. So that's why I say um, there's two things. Number one, I think from a, a general population perspective in Canada, consumers of food, we're feeling it more now than ever. And it's a result of many factors coming, coming to play, but they're here today. But then I think the secondary question is, is it a national priority, right? From, and, and can we align on what those deliverables could be, right? What are those bite-sized chunks we could ag agree? And, and I think that's where, where our lift is. I think there's no doubt the contribution that we have, no doubt the awareness of food and food production. Now's the opportunity to try and bring it together but we need to recognize, again, it's not just about agriculture and food. There's a lot more stakeholders, and, and maybe the other panelists would agree. There's a lot more stakeholders in that discussion now than there were 20 years ago. And I think that, for me, I don't, I don't have the answer. But I also know if we don't try, we're not going to get anywhere. And I also know that we're not going to be able to do it unless a good swell can come together that will have, have a meaningful impact. But I'd be, I'd be curious in your thoughts on that. Sorry, I'm not supposed to ask the question. But, but, but and so I was gonna, because I was gonna ask Steve, I mean, the, the trade negotiations space has a lot more voices in it. I would imagine if you look at the beginning of your career, the stakeholders you would meet in the context of a trade negotiation are very different than the stakeholders that you would be expected to meet with today preparing for a trade negotiation. Mm -hmm. yes. How has how that played out and what impact does that actually have on the work that you do? Well, it, it makes it more complicated, of course, um, uh, and it's more of a challenge. But I think what I found is that the more time you can spend with stakeholders from whatever, wherever they might be coming from, the better off you are. Because over time, you're not only learning a lot <clears throat> from them about their interests, they're starting to hear a lot from you about how can we develop this strategy and they're going to learn the constraints of government or the opportunities of government eventually if you spend enough time with stakeholders and i've tried to do this myself um, you'd start to become of closer mind um, you start to converge on uh, agreeing to a path forward and once you reach that point then you know you can get a lot done once you reach that point but it involves spending a lot of time up front yeah, let, let me just let me just underscore that point. Uh, that is something that has become part of the Canadian playbook on on trade and uh, trade negotiations. Uh, that you have to know your stakeholder community, and you have to stay very close to them, 
and take them into your confidence about what you're doing and and uh, what what the issues are that you have to resolve it at the table. There are some other countries around the world, including the one that I'm in right now, where that is not a part of their tradition. Uh, the uh, the trade negotiators do the negotiating, uh, and they inform the stakeholders after the fact of what's been done, uh, and that slows the process down uh, and and undermines its long term credibility. So. Uh, Steve's point about stakeholder engagement is critical. It's the only way you succeed. And Mr. Godale, what lesson is there for the agriculture sector in that, again, about talking to kind of that broader uh, stakeholder community, the people that, that maybe uh, we as, as farmers and food processors haven't always talked to? Again, we've got uh, people that have joined us today from the defense and foreign affairs community. Uh, I, clearly, environmental groups are are engaged in a lot more discussions in agriculture um, today than they were 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, what lessons uh, should the sector be learning from that as we think about that broader engagement and bringing more people into the fold as we develop a strategy? Excellent point. It works both ways. Just as the, the trade negotiators, negotiators have to stay close to their stakeholders, uh, a, uh, a, a very vital uh, sector of the economy like agriculture uh, needs to identify who its stakeholders are in the environmental community, in the, uh, the, the other sectors that have particular interests that, uh, that bear upon agriculture and that are affected by agriculture. Uh, somebody in the earlier panel said communication is, is critical. It absolutely is. Uh, and it works both ways. You've got to be you've got to be as good a listener as you are a uh, a communicator. Chantel, when you're listening to the stakeholders that that you see engaging in in agriculture, the, the the people in Canada and around the world, what are you hearing them say? What are the lessons that you think we should be taking from what they're saying? Yeah. So I think <clears throat> one thing that that we continue to, there's a couple things. One is our stakeholders are, are very, very different, but we learn a ton from them, right? So if we think about, um, if we, I'll use a Canadian, a simple Canadian example, but a great Canadian example, Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, right? Who, who were your leads, right? In terms of you couldn't do it, it was McDonald's working with cattlemen, working with WWF. Right. So and those stakeholders change all the time, but but we we must, must, must be as inclusive as possible from that perspective, not with a lens of today, but with a very long term view. You don't have all of the answers. You're not going to get it right all the time. But that agility, which has also been a theme that's come through today, I think, is absolutely critical. The second piece that I would really call out. So we talk about finding allies potentially from a trade perspective as well. And a lot of my day, you know, from a global perspective with folks in South America, with folks in Australia, because guess what? They too have been amazing innovators from a field production. Our production systems are the same. They have, you know, the same challenges. They've put a lot of innovation in over the last, last 20 years. So there's opportunities there where we have similar interests that, that we can continue to move forward. And I think that 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 lens, right? And then other 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 areas as well, right? Whether that be Europe, um, uh, you know, on on things like what are some of the tools of the future that we can use around innovation and field, et cetera, right? So I think that's what we need to think, non-traditional stakeholders, not just today to get that the job done to deliver those outcomes. But then the second area, if we layer in to trade and, and food security then what are some of those other common interests that we have that we can also work together to, to leverage some of that low hanging fruit, if you will. So um, again, this is mo isn't one of the questions that, that we prepared in advance, but I hope Steve will let me ask this because <laughs> innovation has been a theme that's come up regularly, but trade and market access for innovative products is an issue. Um, again, I'll go back to your mm -hmm. time at negotiating the EU trade agreement. Clearly, some of the tools that we use, like carca carcass washes on, on uh, beef, 
is one of the barriers to actually getting access. And so um, if you look at that, if you look at biotech approvals, if you look at kind of the long list of things that we think of as innovative products that are delivering a more sustainable sector that are solutions to food security, market access rules stand in, in the way. And so we've talked about the challenges with, with the WTO, but, but bilaterally, what do we need to be doing differently to try and actually solve these irritants? Mm -hmm. Well, I think these irritants have been, I think, largely considered impossible to completely eradicate uh, for as long as I was doing that kind of work. Um, you could make progress from time and time again, but, uh, but no real breakthroughs very often, uh, unless you're dealing with something very time specific. But I think the challenge is that, you know, I'll use the, the, I think it was raised earlier today, the challenges of getting into the EU market under CETA. Well, we knew about those barriers when we were negotiating. We knew them very well. Um, the EU said right up front they were not going to be changing them. And the fundamental difference was the EU had a very different perspective on how you should be treating um, carcasses, uh, for your example, um, before they get processed. Um, we had very specific practices here that were very different. Now, in that situation, and it still exists, we're trying to sell to the European Union. Um, we've got to get across, find a path across their very different notion of food hygiene and, and protection and ours. Um, if we want to sell to a customer, we have to give them what they want. It's not, I don't think there are cases of this, but I don't think the Europeans have developed their entire system on food inspection on the basis of another layer of protectionism, I think it's developed internally to try to provide safe food in the way that they'd like to do. So if we're selling to a customer, we have to tailor what we do to that customer. Now that can get very complicated across many markets. So we need to do a lot more work in trying to get common understandings of what the best way is. If the best way to address environmental issues, we can start to negotiate multilaterally we should be able to address other issues that, you know, what's the most effective way of, uh, of harmonizing food inspection systems. A big challenge, without a doubt, but we're going to have all of these problems until we get to that point. If we talk more about common outcomes around the world, do you think it makes it any easier to try and find solutions in that space? Oh, I think it does. It's going to vary a bit from market to market. It's going to be very different in negotiating an outcome with Europe, which I think could be done, as compared to negotiating an outcome uh, in you know, some countries of Africa or Asia where the food standards and the ability to pay for uh, higher cost treatments aren't going to be the same. So adjustments would have to be made. So with the last couple of minutes that are left, I want to ask the three panelists the same question. Um, as we, again, try and tie all of these loose ends together, what is one thing that you want everyone to think about Canadian agriculture and food and our place in a hungry world as they leave today? So maybe, uh, High Commissioner, I'll start with you again first. Well, the, uh, the hungry world needs Canada, and Canada has huge productive capacity and science capacity and innovation capacity. Uh, and uh, we need to uh, put our Canadian uh, expertise in the window, loud and clear, with lots of, lots of color, lots of volume. Uh, I think the world will find what Canada has to offer in the food sector to be pretty compelling. Uh, and uh, when we put our mind to these challenges in the past, uh, we have uh, we have found those solutions. One little technical thing on the on the point that Steve was just discussing. Let's get our scientists between the EU, the UK, and the US and Canada talking to each other more. Uh, the the regulatory scientists. Uh, it's amazing what they can what they can do if you actually get them in the in the same room and they realize that uh, they're actually talking about the same thing. Uh, but I think communicate Canada and its food capacity loud and clear and proudly. Steve, what's one thing you want people to leave thinking? 
Um, well, I think that we all need to keep in mind that um, we shouldn't necessarily just be looking at ad hoc solutions to different issues. I think where the real gap is, is in broader solutions uh, that are going to try to fundamentally get to the problems that we that we need to look at. So when it comes to to Canada, we have huge advantages when it comes to the food security issue. Um, that food exporter, one of the largest. Um, we have advantages in the environmental sector, how we're addressing those types of issues as well. Um, and we're regarded as a, as a good trading partner. We don't have the baggage of a US or the Europeans or definitely not China. So we're welcome in most markets, um, uh, at least from a general kind of level. So the, the one thing I would like to leave, and this won't be a surprise given what I've said so far, is that if Canada is going to take advantage of any of this, then it can't be a spectator. It can't just watch this happen and, and just hope for the best. We've got to get out in front of it. We've got to have our strategy. We've got to start finding ways to execute it. We've got to work with allies to try to get others on board. We need a vision. We need a plan. Chantel, the one thing you want people to leave thinking? Oh, I'm not just going to give you one thing, Tyler. Uh, so so <laughs> number, number one, I think that plan, that long-term vision, this is a long-term game. Right? We're in it for another 100, another 200 years, and that's going to continue to evolve. We need that vision, but we also need to be aware of what those things are in the short term, that we need to make sure we don't create impediments, that we, look, that we turn challenges that we have into opportunities to feed that long-term vision. In order to do that, not everybody's going to be happy. Right? We're all going to mm -hmm. have to be comfortably uncomfortable. There is going to be give and take. There's going to have to be give and take across that, that, that value meal that you go and buy, whether that be the oil, the protein, etc. That, that goes into it. There's, go, there's regional differences we have. We need to recognize that we are going to be comfortably uncomfortable. And then I think the next end, we have new lenses, right, that we need to take on. And we need to think about what are the lens and the concerns of, of 30 to 40 to 50 years from now. And the one thing that, that hasn't come in this discussion, and regretfully, I'm sorry, I'm just mentioning it right now, is people. People. Whether that be the, the, the farmers, the ranchers that produce our food, whether that be the scientists that enable those discussions, whether that be the people that go into our plants every day, we need a strong talent and labor strategy to support agriculture and food. And agriculture and food needs to come to be a place to go to, a place to go to, not to go through. That's what, that's what we need to aspire to. And if we think longer term, all of those together, I think will continue to enable a ton of opportunity and growth. Great. Thank you very much, Chantel, Steve, and High Commissioner for joining us today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that.